do you like Harry Potter books and movies? Who is your favourite character and do you teach Transfiguration? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And I will turn into a cat at any moment. Um, yes, my uh, favourite character, of course, is Professor McGonagall. I uh, do not yet teach Transfiguration, but I'm currently in discussions about a curriculum change for next year. And uh, yes, I love Harry Potter and I love the books and the films. So thank you. Did you have, oh, you said Dr. McGonagall was favourite, your favourite character, of course. Professor McGonagall, yes. Dr. Collier, did you have a favourite Hogsworth character? Um, I like Ron um, because he's always trying to work out what's going on. Uh, and that seems a bit like what I'm trying to do much of the time. Excellent. Uh, so I've just realised that I've actually forgotten to introduce both of you this evening. So we might do that before we go on to the next question. So Dr. Collier, I actually don't believe that you need any introduction as you've been an outstanding head of our school for 12 years, a leading educator, uh, a wonderful um, example of leadership for the school. But I thought it might be nice if you had took this opportunity to introduce us to Dr. McGonagall for those of us who don't know her and also how you found her. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd be delighted to, to do that. Uh, some parents have been part of the PNF for years, know uh, what I might call the backstory, uh, but for the sake of everyone else, I shall explain it. I went to England on sabbatical leave in 2012 and I asked to be sent to schools which were doing wonderful things in lifting academic standards and in authentic Christian education. And much to my surprise, I was sent to a school in an industrial town in southern Yorkshire, which was manifesting multi-generational unemployment. And there I was introduced to the senior vice principal, um, Dr. Julie McGonagall. I almost missed that connection because I found out later it was her first day back from maternity leave and if I'd come a day earlier she wouldn't have been there. And the story I heard from senior staff was simply extraordinary that the school that had been there before had been judged to be a failing school by the English authorities and the school had been closed and the executive staff had been dismissed and the whole operation had been shifted virtually across the paddock to new facilities and with the same despondent and demoralised uh, teachers and students, oppositional uh, defiant students, a small new executive were brought in to try to salvage this situation the school had been doing very poorly on all indicators and a certain Dr McGonagall was given the task of lifting the school by its bootstraps and a few years later the school was winning national awards for academic excellence with the same staff and the same community and the same families of students and whereas hardly anybody had been getting into university, now an extraordinary number were getting into university, including medicine and law, and including places like Cambridge and Oxford. And how the school had done this under Dr. McGonagall's leadership was a great story. So I just had half a day there and I came home and thought, wow, this is just fantastic. And I badgered a poor Mr. Swibble to develop some of the same methods of tracking students to lift academic outcomes. Well, about two and a half years later, I got an email out of the blue from Dr McGonagall saying she and her husband thought it might be rather good if she came to work at St Andrews Cathedral School. Well, it didn't take a lot of time to think that was a good idea, but it actually did take 18 months to make it happen. Uh, immigration and all of that kind of thing. And so Dr McGonagall arrived and spent all 12 months as Deputy Head Academic Improvement in 2017. And in that year, uh, Sachs went from doing very well academically to doing very, very well indeed. And ever since that time, Dr McGonagall has continued 
initially part-time and then full-time on our staff, uh, spending some weeks a year on the ground until COVID put an end to that in Australia. And it has been perhaps rather peculiar that one of our deputy heads has actually lived in England. Uh, that's a bit unusual, but it's worked very well indeed for us because uh, Julie's had a massive impact on uh, teaching and learning and staff development and policy uh, from a distance uh, and certainly mentoring staff and resolving issues. And she's been constantly part of meetings uh, at an unsociable hour in England. Um, I recall one council meeting uh, strategic planning, she was online between 2 and 3 a.m. her time. Uh, but now we actually have her in our own time zone, in, in our own time zone, and we have a term uh, for the baton to be passed from me to her. Uh, so she's hitting the ground running uh, and raring to go, uh, already in possession in her uh, temporary office in St Andrew's house and uh, moving into the head's office uh, on the 2nd of January next year. So I think that'll probably suffice as an introduction. Thank you, John. All right, we um, have a bit of a movie and book theme. So the next question is about movies, but it's not asking you what your favourite movie is. It's asking you about a movie you did not like and why didn't you like it? So we might throw this one to you first, Dr Collier. Um, Kate and I went to see uh, the uh, story of Miles Davis's life, uh, the great jazz trumpeter. Uh, I mistakenly thought it'd be full of jazz. Uh, it wasn't actually full of jazz, it was full of expletives. Uh, we didn't like it at all. Julie, do you have one? Um, I think I recently watched um, Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty, and they were they were all right, but I didn't love them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> all right, we're going to go to books. We're staying on this theme. The most recent book you have read, but we want both your most recent non-fiction and your most recent fiction. This can include books you may have read with your children or your grandchildren. So your most recent fiction book and your most recent non-fiction book. And we'll start with you, Julie. So uh, it just so happens that I've got some books on my table here. That helps. <laughs> I shall show you the book that I am reading <laughs> currently. <laughs> and this is heard of that author? This is an actual real story. I'm not just, you know, <laughs> being nice to John. But yes, I'm actually reading John's book, Scandals, Skirmishes and Scallywags. Uh, that, that, that's an outstandingly good book. I would highly recommend it to everyone. I'm also reading this one uh, called The Robot Will See You Now, which is about uh, artificial intelligence, which is also highly recommended. I'm not sure if John's, if I'm classifying John's book as fiction or <laughs> non-fiction. <laughs> You'll have to tell us. You'll have to tell us, John. <laughs> there is no embellishment at all. My favourite story in John's book, I would really genuinely recommend it to everyone, is when he, um, a year 10 student came to uh, complain to him that somebody was not being very kind to him and, uh, and does a joke. John said, we'll just throw him over the back of the fence. And the boy did actually go and throw <laughs> the other boy over the back of the fence. So yes, be careful what you wish for. Uh, oh, that's gold. Yeah. All right, John, so your books that you've been reading. Well, let me just tell you the story uh, that Julia recounted was yes, uh, 45 years ago and it, it ended badly because the boy ended up with a broken leg. Uh, oh. However, his big brother, uh, uh, in a sense, paid me back uh, by giving me a very painful injection in hospital some years later. Um, well, reading to grandchildren, um, my grandchildren all love uh, Mr. Little's noisy train. And because we've got seven grandchildren, they all seem to pass through the book. And I don't know how many times I've read it, but I have to say it doesn't take long to read. 
in terms of something more major, uh, Kate said to me some years ago, everything you read is for work, you must read something for pleasure. So um, I'm indulging my love of um, British naval history by reading the Lord Ramage series of novels uh, set in, in the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, that's the fiction. The non-fiction part, I've just read Tom Holland's great book, Dominion, uh, which explains the extraordinary footprint of Christian faith on Western society over the last 2000 years. Tom Holland's an academic historian who writes beautifully. Thank you. Uh, now, I'm not sure how many of our parents, I'm sure they all know Andrew, who's our lovely uh, concierge at St Andrew's house and welcomes people very often with signs when you're first coming back to school after a break. What you might not know about uh, Mr Andrew Simpson is that he is known as the Poet Laureate on staff because he writes fantastic poems that um, Dr Collier often shares with us all. So, John, you won't be surprised by this question might have been sent in by him because it is, apart from the sax poet laureate, who is your second favourite poet? So, John, if you'd like to answer that one and then we'll go to Julie. W.B. Yeats, uh, the great Irish poet of 100 years ago. Um, I enjoy his poetry immensely. John stole my answer. Ah! <laughs> That is genuinely what I was just about to say. So there you go. Uh, you're talking to two English teachers here. Yes, true. All right, staying. Uh, now we're moving on to things you may have done as children. What was, I suspect this one was sent in by one of our junior school students. What was the naughtiest thing that you had <laughs> done as a child? So Julie, that one's for you. The oh. naughtiest thing you did as a child and what did your parents do <gasps> say? Oh no. Oh. I'm giving Dr. Collier, John's got a bit more time to think about it. has got a bit more time to think. Was a bit longer away. <laughs> so one of the things that let's just say didn't get a good reaction was uh, I used to go to piano lessons and I had this teacher who I didn't think really was a very good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that when I practiced, she thought I hadn't practiced. And when I hadn't practiced, I thought she had practiced. So I wasn't very amused with her. Anyway, went into piano this particular day and she asked me to play the scales. And I uh, happened to look at her and, and said, no, I didn't want to play the scales. I wasn't in the mood to play the scales. So um, that that she then rang my parents that night to express the fact that I had uh, been so defiant and uh, yeah let's just say it didn't it didn't go down well <laughs> yes it was a humiliating end what came next let's put it that way <laughs> uh, if there's any if there's any students watching yeah don't do that <laughs> that's my advice <laughs> Uh, I've just thought of something that uh, still sends a sort of chill of shame up my spine. Um, I think I was probably seven or eight and uh, we were staying with family friends in the country and my father decided that he would help the uh, father of the other family uh, who was a farmer uh, throw the hay off the back of the truck to the sheep. Uh, so my role while the men were on the back of the truck was to drive the truck. Um, I could probably barely reach the pedals with my feet, uh, but it occurred to me it might be quite fun to try an accelerator. Um, so I did that, um, knocked the men over, uh, they fell over on the back of the truck and I ran over a sheep. Um, I did get into rather a lot of trouble uh, and I didn't feel good about the sheep. Fair enough. Fair enough, yes. There's one um, one more one about a child. Did you have a favourite cuddly toy when you were growing up? So the equivalent of a teddy bear or stuffed animal. This one's come oh, from one of yes. our school teachers. <laughs> yeah, I did. I had a kind of um, a thing, in fact, that my daughter still has. Um, it was called Jumbo Love. <laughs> it was one of those, you know, those really squishy um it's not furry, but it was very squishy. Anyway, I had that and and it was sewn and re-sewn and, and passed on and still is here in existence. 
I have a black uh, soft toy lamb, uh, certainly not the sheep I'd run over. Um, and uh, I don't know what ever happened to it. Uh, it must have disappeared, uh, what shall I say, uh, nearly 65 years ago. <laughs> It is always those special ones, though. You both remember what your special toys are. Mm. Uh, now, I want you both to cast your mind back, not quite as far as that, but to the very first time you ever came into SACS. So before either of you were appointed, um, you know, officially on a long term basis, the first time you actually physically saw SACS, what was your first impression? Shall we go with you, John, first? Um. I think possibly the first time I came, um, I thought this must be a very difficult school to run in high rise with all these different floors. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm in a, a school with wide open spaces, never imagining that I'd end up as head of that school. Um, that was a very fleeting um, uh, memory. Uh, the other memories are bracketed together. Uh, I had three interviews at school for the position before I was appointed. And each time I came in, I got hopelessly lost, which is the experience of most people when they come to sex to begin with. And each time I was rescued by a different student from a different year group, uh, who treated me with great courtesy and friendliness and helpfulness without having any idea who I was or why I was there. I was just a random member of the public as far as they could tell. And the graciousness with which the students dealt with me made me think this is obviously a really good place to be. Uh, these kids are lovely. Uh, I've got two two memories. So the one was the first time. So when we arrived in Sydney, so when we first came to work at St Andrews in 2017, uh, I'd never been to Australia before. So we arrived in Sydney, we'd never been to the school before. And I think it was a Sunday afternoon and no, maybe it was Saturday afternoon and we were just um, exploring the area and we thought we would uh, walk past the school and get a sense of just the building. Anyway, we walked past the school and out of the building came this woman <laughs> running towards us with this with her arms open wide shouting it's so good to see you and I was thinking oh my goodness we've literally just walked past this school I don't know who this person could possibly be anyway it was Robin Pedley uh, for those of you who know Robin um, she obviously knew us because she had enrolled the children in the school and so she rem she knew she knew what they looked like Anyway, so she literally came running at us and and then she brought us into the building, took us all around the building and gave us uh, the most incredible tour. So, I mean, people say Sax is a warm community and that for me was, you know, my first impression was just li quite literally a hug. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a, a wonderful uh, memory. My second one was on my very first day of work. So uh, those of you who have um, been talking a little bit about Harry Potter, for those of you who don't know Harry Potter, um, Professor McGonagall was the deputy head, is the deputy head of Hogwarts. And in some of the books, she then becomes the head of Hogwarts. Anyway, she's a, a woman who has her hair in quite a severe, um, tied back in quite a severe bun. Anyway, at school, I wear my hair back. So I was standing waiting for the lift and this year seven girl arrived and uh, it was just her and I and, and uh, she looked at me and she said, um, Harry Potter. And I said, uh, yes. And then uh, she said, it suits you. And I said, I said, all right, why is that then? And she said, and she put she had this long pause and then she just said hmm it's the hair and the whole air of strictness <laughs> so that was day one of my experience of St Andrew's Cathedral School that particular girl went on to become school captain 
and I never wore my hair in that particular way again, as you can imagine. <laughs> so yeah, some very, very good memories of my initial uh, experience of St Andrew's Cathedral School. Some very uh, uh, um, students full of personality and staff very warm and I have never been disappointed with that view ever since. Oh, that's that's really, really lovely. Um, so on that note, then uh, we might stay with you, Julie. What characteristic of the school, seeing you aren't a brand newbie, you have spent a lot of time both remotely and here for that year. What characteristic of the school are you most looking forward to about um, being there as head, which which is the bit that made you think, yes, I want to work at Saks, I want to be head of that school. Um, yeah, I think it's that. I think it's 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 people. I mean, it, it's staff, students, and parents. My experience of all three um, sets of of those people was incredible in 2017, um, and I would say as a community. It is warm, it is thoughtful, it is trying to do new things. Uh, the expertise of the staff is incredible. Uh, every other person I meet, I'm surprised by just how good they are. Um, so I, it's the pe the people and, and of course, um, you know, you, Lynn, champion the community. And I would say that that is so much part of the DNA of what St Andrews is. Uh, and and that is what I'm most looking forward to. And uh, it is quite a unique thing, I would say, uh, in schools that I've experienced. That's, yeah, thank you. That's always lovely to, um, very exciting when your head supports the community and your, we work constantly in the community. <laughs> uh, got added bonus for I'm me. not just saying that. Uh, no, it is, and I have to say that, that, that is why I do work with the community because that was obviously very much my experience way, way, way back in 2005 when I was the parent of a junior school child here at St Andrews. Uh, John, in terms of characteristics of the school, is there one characteristic of the school that you are most proud of? Um, I think the, the culture of the school is what makes the school. The culture of the school is the lovely relational care that uh, is exhibited uh, between student and student, staff and student, student and staff, parents uh, towards everybody. Uh, not all schools are like this. Uh, people who don't experience any other school can easily take it for granted. It's something very special. Uh, when I came to the school in 2010, I interviewed 200 students in groups of 25. And I said to each group, what is it that you like most about the school? And every group gave me the same answer, obviously in different words. They said the relationships. We love coming to school because we get on so well with our friends. We get on really well with our teachers. Um, and what I found is that many of them came to school on the holidays um, because that's where they met their friends. They met their friends uh, at school and off they went to uh, do whatever they did. Uh, go uh, go for a walk in the park or, what, or go to the movies or whatever they did. Uh, but school was the hub and uh, there's something very special about the warmth of the school, about the loveliness of the school. Yes, this certainly is. Uh, for those of you who don't know when Dr Collier first started as head of school, I was not in fact on staff. I was doing Helen's role. I was the uh, PNF president and the anxiety in the parent community was, is this new head going to understand our community, understand how much we all care for each other and what it means to us to sort of develop these relationships and uh, Obviously, very much that was very important to John, and I'm really excited that it's going to be very important to Julie because I think that's ultimately what SACS is all about. Now, we're going to go to some fun questions again now that have come in. This one I particularly like. If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, only one meal over and over again, what would it be? I think we might ask Julie this one first. Oh, dear. It's well, <laughs> As a child, I used to, um, everybody thought I was a bit strange because I ate yogurt and fruit 
all the time. That was my staple meal. Um, if you asked me now, probably bread and wine. If you had to just have a thing, that would be what I would eat all the time <laughs> and drink. <laughs> Uh, John, what about you? I'm guessing cheese, but I might be wrong. <laughs> well, I do like cheese very much. Uh, as Helen knows, uh, Helen buys cheese for PNF meetings, and I think I probably eat most of it. Um, but I think if I could have just one food and just stay on that forever, I'd choose baklava. Oh. Uh, I think uh, Kate and I spent <laughs> weeks in, in Greece uh, on long service leave 40 years ago. Uh, eating mostly back with uh, great experience. Yeah, I thought it would have been Tim Tam. So there we go. The peanut <laughs> as well as they. It would be Kingston's food. for John. <laughs> Kingston's for John. Back with, uh, um, with Tim Tams for supper and Kingston's uh, <laughs> for dessert. Kingston's for after supper. Mm. The after supper supper. Uh, in terms of housework, what is your least? favourite chore to do around the house? What do you get up and think, oh, please, will someone else do that? Uh, uh, John, who, who sorry. You like to... uh, well, for me, it's for me, it's a vacuuming because I'm allergic to dust. Uh, but there's there's someone uh, here who is very kind to me and looks after that. And Julie? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm reimagining chores now that I'm in Australia. So I... <laughs> <laughs> I find, you know, I had about 16 lots of ironing to do at the weekend and um, and I did them outside in the sunshine. So, you know, they were my children were laughing at me. I was there in my swimming suit and my ironing and my podcast. And they were like, I've got to get a picture of this. This is, you know, reimagining chores. <laughs> Definitely living up to the English, there's one bit of sunshine and that's so right. out you are. <laughs> Definitely up to that. Yeah, that's my very exciting Saturday afternoon. All right, now we've got a series of people you may like to meet if you could choose and why. So we might start with the first one. Is there any figure from history you would like to meet and why would you pick that person? And just so you know, we're also going to do this with celebrity and fictional character. So the first one is anyone from history that you would like to meet? Well, the obvious answer is to to meet Jesus in in ancient Palestine. Um, you know, the, the Lord God himself, the greatest uh, teacher who's ever lived, and I'm a teacher. Um, if we step away to something more conventional, I'd say Nelson Mandela. Mm. Um, when Kate and I went to South Africa, uh, Mandela had just retired, we're talking 20 years ago, and his impact on the society was simply extraordinary. Um, his, his own Christian vision of forgiveness and reconciliation um, was transformative in South Africa, and he actually still ruled the country, not that he had any formal position of power, but his opinion had such moral force, it really determined what uh, what was going to happen. And all classes, all races absolutely revered him. He was a colossal figure simply by his moral authority and, uh, and I think uh, his sheer goodness. What about a celebrity? Is there any celebrity you would like to meet? I'm not, I'm not big on celebrities. Um, I'll, you'll have to come back to me. I'll let my wife uh, give me a hint. <laughs> and a fictional character, maybe? Um, well, look, let me say celebrity, uh, Sachin Tendulkar, the, the great Indian test mm. cricketer, uh, the, the finest uh, batsman of his age, uh, the only modern batsman to be compared to Bradman, by Bradman. Um, That'd, that'd do. Uh, fictional. And is there a fictional character you might like to meet? Well, I do. I do love the great uh, uh, cartoon character Foghorn Leghorn, uh, <laughs> and, and possibly also Darkwing, Darkwing Duck. Um, my children, when they were little, used to wake me up when Darkwing Duck was on television if I was still asleep. <laughs> that was not an answer I was expecting at 
Paul. All right, Julie, over to you. So it's historical um, person, a um, celebrity and a fictional person. Who would you like to meet and why? Um, I think his, historical, you probably won't be surprised to know that I'm, there's an entire line of historical women that I'm interested in meeting, not least uh, Joan of Arc. Uh, that would be a very interesting meeting, or Boudicca would also be a very, very, very interesting meeting. Maybe a bit of a bloody meeting, but an interesting one nonetheless. Um, so yeah, that yeah. Um, I'd also I'd also like to meet Margaret Thatcher. I have quite a number of questions for her. Not, <laughs> not, not. Uh, not gentle questions, let's just put it that way. Um, in terms of, uh, what was it, historical, celebrity? And fictional. Uh, celebrity, I, I'd love to meet Malala. I don't know if you count her as a celebrity, but there's a number of teenagers in the world at the moment I'd absolutely love to meet because I just think the whole teenage voice uh, change maker is just brilliant and the fact that they're standing up and being leaders. So uh, that would be my choice there. And what was it, fictional character? Mm -hmm. Oh, my my um, uh, my two favorite books when I was younger were a little book called Mr. God, This Is Anna. If you ever get the chance to read that, it's absolutely outstanding about a child who has an understanding of the universe that is uh, unique and I'd love to meet her. And similarly, there is a, a kind of almost a, for the next age of child, there's a uh, Sophie's World, which is um, a similar type of story where it takes philosophy, the history of philosophy, but it weaves it through the story of Sophie Adamson. Um, and I'd love to meet her. So these are two girls who um, very much explore philosophy and and you know big questions about the universe through the eyes of a child, and it really does bring an understanding. And yeah, I'd love to meet them. Amazing. All right, interesting. You know, everyone's going to go out and look for those books now. To oh, see do do. I will <laughs> they, they will they will really enrich your life. So yeah, don't don't stop. Um, we do have some sporting questions. I think, you know, John, you've introduced the great um, batter himself. So the question is, uh, do you have a favourite sporting team? What sports do you like? Do you have a favourite sporting team? And did you play a particular sport as a child? It was a question that came in earlier, so you might as well package the three. So what sports do you like? Do you have a particular team? And what did you play as a child? Um. Cricket is my passion. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, I have played squash, uh, which usually ended badly. Uh, most of my broken bones uh, were the result of squash. Um, I had a terrible interaction with my lovely wife who ran into my squash racket with her nose, um, which ended up broken. The nose, that is, not the racket. Uh, she married me anyway, a uh, very lovely, patient woman. Uh, at the age of 16, I was heavyweight champion of the Cumberland Judo Club, uh, which sounds impressive, <laughs> except that it was a small club in someone's garage. Um, and uh, my cricket interest was not reflected in any actual ability, unfortunately. So my coaching career was always do what I tell you, not what I can show you. <laughs> and what about you, Julie? So um, as a kid, I was a runner. Uh, I, I know that might surprise you, but actually um, I started off as a sprinter um, and then ended up as uh, long distance, which is slightly odd uh, transition. But um, I would say my children, my eldest child is very into sailing. So we are very involved in sailing and um, follow sailing a lot. 
and my youngest two and my husband are very into triathlon. So we also follow that and um, do a bit of that. So um, those would be the sports. They're not they're not necessarily the um, typical. I mean, they do the kids play, you know, the regular cricket and that kind of thing. But um, those would be the two that more more stand out, I would say. Uh, you might like to share that, in fact, we have an old Andrian who is a double gold Olympic medal. Um, triathlete. Uh, or no, sailor. no, sailor. sailor oh, amazing. Sailor, who did the, got the gold medal. I can't tell you what class it is because I'm not really very informed in sailing. But yes, that's one of our old Andrian's um, oh, graduates, brilliant. the double gold medal. I think one was in London and one was in China. So. There you go. That's a little bit of trivia we'll have to send your way to <laughs> add to I'll, the I'll go and look that up. But I, I mean, I think the mixed the mixed uh, teams in both sailing and in triathlon in the Olympics this year, I think were absolutely mm. um, breathtaking. And it was just brilliant to see mixed sport. I think that's wonderful, too. Uh, and then seeing the question, the topic has sort of come up, Julie. So this is not at all a fair question to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Who are you supporting in the ashes over summer? Oh, ouch. I, I declined to answer the question. <laughs> very wise, very wise. Could, and could be we have one for you as well. Um, so because we're assuming that's an easy answer for you and that's getting you off the hook. So now that you're leaving, you're in a position where you can actually tell us the honest truth about which house you support. So I'm fairly confident it would be York House, which is obviously the best house. Better be, John. But um, <laughs> it, it's probably time for you to, you know, confess which is your favourite house. All of them. <laughs> oh, empty. come on. I don't, I don't have a child in any house. If you'd asked me at my last school where my children were there as students, it would have been Claremont House, uh, of which they were all members. Um, but uh, I can't express any preference. I like them all. And I did my very best when Kate and I were in England to go to every cathedral after which a house was named and send a photograph back to the head of house, uh, which was rather well received. Yes, there is a very small exclusive group of us who have been to all eight um, cathedrals. I am very proud to say that I am one of them. Um, I was only going to seven and I got messages from so many people saying, how dare you miss Durham, that I made sure that we changed our holiday to make sure that we saw Durham <laughs> Cathedral as well. So, uh, yes, I'm also quite proud of that. I think Mr. Body can do that. But I'm also very proud of York House because my daughter was a house captain and got the Dean Pet Pitt Shield in year 12. Um, it does annoy Zach, who's producing the show, because he was actually a uh, House captain for Westminster. So there is a lot of house rivalry goes on in the community engagement team. Well, I, um, well, I, I am very, very uh, unbiased, um, apart from the fact that York is the best. Ah, well, <laughs> well because you live to How York. can it not? So I just said to you York. <laughs> we did have a strange experience that's related to York House. We had no idea that the McGonagall's lived in York, and I think it was before uh, we had met. Um, and uh, we came out of uh, a, a castle uh, in York uh, to be greeted by an ex-student saying, hello, Dr. Collier, uh, which is not quite where we expected to see a sex person. And that ex-student is now married to Mr. Kytik. Uh, so the connections of life are really quite extraordinary. Well, Sorry, Andrew. No, I was just. You go, Julie. I'm getting distracted by all the questions coming oh, in. I'm are you? Well, yeah, the time, I'll, I'll so I'm just trying to judge which questions. ones I'm going to ask. Okay, that's right. No, I was just going to tell a story about um, meeting people in funny places because um, Andrew uh, is an academic and uh, was teaching at Sheffield University, and um, he went on a field course, and uh, someone turned up who also had been a student at Sachs and who had. Um, uh, had, had spent a year uh, working at Saks as well, and uh, that was in Sheffield uh, itself. So, yeah, it's a small world. Well, the remarkable thing about Mr. Kajic marrying this ex-student is that um, 
he was not in the school when she was a student and they met subsequently at university. So again, the connections are simply extraordinary. And I might add that she was also in York House because she was also in my daughter's year. So there we go. There you <laughs> I was congratulated Chris when he became head of York House and I was quite pleased his lovely wife Jade would have been excited. Christmas lunch or Christmas dinner? Do you do celebrate Christmas in the evening or the morning and or lunchtime? And also, uh, Julie, did you have any plans yet with how you're going to cope with the summer Christmas? We might start off with you. Do you have your big Christmas meal, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? And have you thought of how you're going to deal with a um, hot summer's day this year? So we uh, have traditions in our family whereby we, and that's the wider family, so we normally spend Christmas with my, my parents and my brothers and their children. And the tradition is that uh, everybody will get a stocking on Christmas Eve. That's the, those are the small presents. And then Christmas Day, it comes the big presents. And then we go to church and then we have, uh, uh, we have um, sherry and Christmas cake after that. And then it's um, about three o'clock, we would have uh, a big Christmas, I don't know whether you call it lunch or dinner. It's probably in the middle of those two things. Linner, we'll call it in honour of you, Lynn. And, <laughs> and um, uh, yes, how am I going to cope with the sunshine? I have to say, last time we were here at Christmas, and this is another big shout out to the community, we had, I think, four invitations to come and be with people at Christmas on Christmas Day. And I was absolutely stunned by that because whilst uh, in the UK people are uh, friendly, there is not, you wouldn't really um, just on, on a whim invite people for Christmas. That's quite a, you know, seen as quite an intimate thing. Um, and the hospitality that was shown to us during the Christmas when we were here was absolutely outstanding. And I think we ate um, uh, a mixture of Japanese and Chinese food that Christmas. Oh, yeah, it wasn't a Christmas dinner at all in, in the traditional turkey sense. Wow. Um, John, what do you and your family do? You've got a lovely extended family now. Um, I have to make a correction to my previous remarks as I've received a family message <laughs> telling me that my grandchildren are in Salisbury at St Andrews. I oh. nearly said something, but I wasn't game. I will. Ouch quickly be in trouble. Uh, so there you are, I've corrected my remarks. Of course, I'm very pro Salisbury, absolutely. Um, now, as far as Christmas is concerned, um, we we remember, it doesn't seem long ago, but it clearly is, uh, trying to make credible uh, footprints on Christmas Eve for uh, Santa's reindeer uh, for our children to see and putting out hay on Christmas Eve uh, so the children would see that for uh, Santa's reindeer to eat uh, when when Santa came. Um, those days have actually long gone. Um, and what we do is a three o'clock-ish activity um, with family, family being our three children and their spouses and, and grandchildren. Um, and wonderfully, uh, we're aligned so that our um, our daughters-in-law and son-in-law are on the same cycle of when they go to their parents on Christmas Day or Boxing Day so that we can have all of them either on Christmas Day or all of them on Boxing Day. Now that takes some arranging, let me tell you, so we're very glad about that. Yeah, it sounds lovely. Um... All right, we're really getting close to the end. So I'm going to ask just two more questions um, and I'm going on the ones that are liked most in the chat. And one is, do you have any pets? And if so, what are their names? So um, Dr. Collier, John, I don't know if you have any pets. I know you've got a grand pet. <laughs> um, we, have, we have two grand dogs and two grand rabbits. Um, what we've specialised in in recent years is Dalmatian dogs, and it's come to me to name them all. So, of course, they've all had historical names. Uh, we had Kaiser, and then we had Josephine and Marie Antoinette, 
and Napoleon, uh, and now Luther. Um, and the rabbits are known as Daisy and River, very fun names uh, for rabbits, of course. And the other dog uh, has been gifted to them, and the dog's name is Fern, F-E-R-N, which strikes me as a strange name for a dog, but there you are. And uh, Julia, I can't imagine you've actually had a chance to have pets, but have you had pets before, or do you have any plans for pets? So, or is this really um, contentious because th this is a very sensitive area? So family. If you see my daughter, uh -oh. <laughs> don't mention the pets. <laughs> She's absolutely desperate for any kind of a pet. And of course, we were moving, so we couldn't really have a pet. So much so that she's actually taken to creating her own pets. So there is a lizard that lives outside her door of her bedroom uh, and that she is named Bob Ross. Uh, don't ask me why. And that is her new pet. So she looks after the Bob Ross, the lizard. Oh, that's lovely. But yes, if, if you would like to not mention pets to her, we will keep some family harmony. I have a recommendation. Don't get a pet snake. We um, were convinced by my son <laughs> when he was 10. Now he's considerably older than that and the snake is very, very big and just a little bit scary. Um, yes. And we still have him and he is named, going back to our Hogwarts theme, he is named Snape. And there was a little while there, we didn't know whether he was going to be a good guy or a bad guy in the book. So we're lucky that in the end, he ended up being the right. Um, the right kind of guy. The right kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, now I'm actually going to finish on perhaps a more serious question. This has come up both uh, through emails from parents and it's also come up through the chat, which is basically if you could both um, maybe share how you became Christians. So John, I'll let you begin with this one. Well, my time was a different time from now and my parents uh, were what we call nominal about faith, which is that they didn't actually participate, but were sort of loosely attached. And my father declared at the age of 15 that I should be confirmed in the Anglican Church because it might help me get a job. Um, now, in those days, that was possibly true uh, because they were the days of sectarianism where people were either Protestant or Catholic. Um, so, of course, I went along to confirmation classes and became seriously interested in Christian faith and embraced it, which horrified my parents because they thought one only became interested if one was going to become a clergyman, uh, which I didn't, haven't, and was never my intention. Uh, so I became seriously involved uh, in my faith uh, from the age of 15. Um, for me, I grew up in a Christian family um, I, when I was 20, I went to Oxford, which I think you know, and I was highly intimidated by Oxford and <laughs> everyone there. <laughs> what you, what you soon realise in Oxford is everyone thinks that they shouldn't be there <laughs> and that everyone else is smarter than everyone else. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I understood fear um, and it was interesting because uh, that, that went on for a period of time and then the word grace kept coming into my mind and um, I don't know if you know in the, the song Amazing Grace there's a line that says "Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved and um i asked a friend um about grace who was a christian and they talked to me about grace and then i went along to a church um and understood almost in unison um sin and grace at the same time and and at the and and in the same breath a freedom from fear and um yeah it was a very remarkable period of my life that was transformational and i yeah i'm, I'm utterly deeply committed to my christian faith and and uh, uh yeah could talk about it all day, but I'll stop there. 
Thank you both. Thank you both so much.